Um, hope everyone has been staying safe and well. Welcome to our seventh virtual essay program. It's called The Science of Well-Being, Mindfulness, and Positive Psychology. Um, as COVID-19 spreads around the world, it is vital that we t place health and well-being, both mental and physical, at the forefront of the discussion. And as such, we'd like to take the time to recognize those at the center of it all, our frontline healthcare workers battling COVID-19. They're putting themselves in the path of the pandemic and in this unprecedented crisis, rising to the occasion and caring for our most vulnerable. So thank you from everyone at CDL for the sacrifices you make every day and especially during this pandemic. All of us are deeply grateful to your dedication and courage in keeping our community safe and healthy. Um, today's session is presented to you by CDL's VSSA in collaboration with Active SG. The Singapore Sustainability Academy, or SSA for short, was opened in 2017 and is Singapore's first major 3P partnership space dedicated to advocacy, thought leadership, collaboration on climate action and issues of sustainability. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're pushing out programs usually held at the SSA onto a virtual platform to ensure continued engagement of the community. Um, we're very pleased today to have long-standing partner Active SG with us. Active SG is the nationalist movement for sports and more. As the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the sporting industry, Active SG has also evolved into hosting virtual programs, both free and paid, for members to stay active and healthy. Um, today's session is a teaser of the suite of programs that you can access through their platform, both on the Active SG app and the Active SG Circle. Um, science of well-being, mindfulness, and positive psychology is a topic of focus today. We're lucky to have Sport SG certified health and wellness coach Mark Allison and Deputy Director Ung Bi Kuhn here to share their insight on the subject. This workshop will focus on tips and simple movements to keep um, to help you feel your best both physically and mentally. Um, before we begin, please ensure that your headphones are connected and that your microphone is muted. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and jump into the conversation or click on the chat box at the bottom of your screen to type in a question or comment. We also encourage you to turn on your videos and contribute to this interactive session because the three most interactive participants stand a chance to win $30 active SG care packs. So please join in and have fun. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you go to view options at the top and select side by side mode so that you can see um, our presenters along with their presentation slides. Please also go to the top right of your screen and click on gallery view so that it changes to speaker view. This way you can also toggle the slider in between the PowerPoint slides and the speakers and drag it to make one or the other larger. Note that this session will last about an hour and will be recorded and accessible on our CDL Sustainability YouTube page. So without further ado, let's all welcome Mark and Bikun. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. It's a, uh, it's a uh, pleasure uh, to be here and and to be speaking um, uh, for such a wonderful organization that you know we're partners with in in Singapore and to speak to uh, a bigger cause and something that that uh, I really believe in um, has has opportunity to to shape our future uh, for the better and allow all of us to thrive and so um, today's talk will be on the science of well-being. Um, which fundamentally it's in this new emerging field of positive psychology and mindfulness. And um, just a quick introduction. Um, I actually, I've lived in Singapore now for the last uh, uh, year and, and four months. Um, we've, uh, our company, the Institute of Motion, formed a, um, a partnership. Uh, we started working with Sports Singapore and Active SG um, about 2016. And uh, just about a year and a half ago, we, we begun um, the beginning stages of a preventative healthcare project as a part of Vision 2030. And so um, I, am, uh, I am in the United States right now, visiting family um, now that the travel ban is lifted. So it's 2 a.m. here right now. Uh, so please uh, forgive me if I'm uh, stumbling on my words a little bit, my sleep cycle's a, a bit off. Um, or if the environment seems a little bit funky, I'm in my parents' pool house. Um, but this is uh, this is truly an honor to be here, and I want to thank you guys for your attention and for tuning in. And um, because the bandwidth is a little uh, shaky, I'm going to also turn off my video, so um, we're not interrupted during the presentation, and then I can turn it on again at the end.
Okay. Um, so again, welcome. And uh, today we're, we're just going to go through a brief uh, introduction to positive psychology. It's a huge field. And so uh, I want to keep it simple. I'll keep it brief and, and share the insights and what I believe is the future uh, of how we uh, shape our societies to become more resilient and sustainable. And ultimately, the, the pathway to, to that transformation is through mindfulness. And uh, then we're going to share and put all that together um, with uh, uh, my partner here, B, um, who's going to take you guys through some, some movements to complement um, a lot of the psychology and uh, other science I'm going to talk about. Um, B, uh, I will, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll get on to, uh, with, with the, uh, the talk for today. Well, hi, everybody. My name is B Kun. So my day job is like perhaps most of you, you know, sitting in an office and, and doing some perhaps um, planning work. So um, today's talk is, is really about mindfulness. And later I'm going to bring you through some, I, I call it movement meditation as well. So the other word uh, which uh, Mark used is mindful movements, both are the same. And I'm from Active SG. and just a quick introduction, if you do not know yet, um, I'm sure all of you would have known about Active SG. It is our national movement to get everybody active. So, and, and Mark and I, we have been working on this project called the Active Health Project. So Active Health is a social movement that we believe that everybody can thrive and every organization can flourish. So um, this is very, very um, connected with what Mark is going to share today um, in terms of the introduction to positive psychology. So without further ado, Mark, I shall hand it over back to you yeah, to continue your presentation. Thank you, B. And uh, I, I don't want to talk about myself at all, um, but just to give you context of, of my background, I've spent the last 12 years in, in the fitness industry uh, as a personal trainer, as a fitness manager. Uh, my background is in kinesiology and, um, you know, I, I was more on, on, on the movement, fitness, performance uh, side of, of, uh, of health and well-being. Um, our company, the Institute of Motion, we work with um, professional uh, sports organizations, the NFL, the NBA, uh, NHL, um, and we also work with large, large health uh, organizations and technology organizations like Apple Health, uh, Microsoft Health, and uh, it's we've always thought about things a little bit different as a fitness company, and obviously the changing landscape of of healthcare and how we need to look at the future of uh, sustainability because it's, it's, it's changing so, so fast. Uh, we, we can't keep up and we can't keep up with the burden that it's put onto our healthcare system financially. So um, we've shifted as a company into um, really more of a holistic view of, of this idea of human flourishing and thriving and, um, the Institute of Motion, I mean, we're, we've been around since 2010, um, but we're ultimately an, an applied uh, health and human performance company. And so um, I made a transition about five years ago out of just fitness and sports and into um, this idea of, of, of human flourishing and thriving and started studying coaching psychology. And that led me to uh, my, my graduate degree in, uh, it was a master's of kinesiology in integrative wellness. Um, at a Point Loma in, in California. And it was one of the first programs of its kind because it really helped bridge the gap between um, the movement sciences and, and you know, the mind and the body and also understanding uh, probably what's more important than anything is, is uh, human behavior and, and what constitutes people making decisions to change and uh, change for themselves for good. And from there, um, we've begun this journey of creating a preventative healthcare system um, and, and looking through this a lens of, of not just the body, but the mind and, and how to take our company um, and really the population of Singapore and the world to a different level. It's a, it's a place that we've never been before as a, as a, a world, as a, a healthcare system. 
and it's far away from what the fitness industry is doing right now. Um, but one of our core values is curiosity and we don't get stuck in the dogma and, and, and the, uh, um, a lot, so much of the hearsay and everything that, that goes around about health and wellness. There's a lot of confusion and we try to cut through that and we try to honor that all sides do have benefit and that we need to honor the whole person and, and figure out what they really want. Um, it's not about our agenda. And one of the things that also sets us apart is that we don't really believe that fitness necessarily equals health, right? Uh, you can be very, very fit. You can be uh, a top level athlete, um, a professional athlete at the top of your game, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. And we're seeing the repercussions of that um, all over the world. And so on the fitness side our, and, and uh, high performance side, our top three programming outcomes have actually been around sustainability, resiliency, and injury prevention. It's how do we create and engineer the unbreakable human? And looking at everything from muscle, bones, nerves, fascia, uh, and, and the environments that we can put people in so they can sustain and do what they love and ultimately stay healthy. Now, what we also, as we, as we merge into this field of, of uh, positive psychology, um, looking more at mental health, right? Just because you're healthy, it doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. And that's where our conversation about positive psychology is going to start. And if we look at the definition of wellness, right, which is a little bit different than just health, uh, from the World Health Organization, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Right? And you'll see, me, we'll talk about this continuum a lot, um, but you know, as we shift from, from a disease sick care model, getting people neutral where there's not necessarily illness um, or disease, but they're not necessarily well, they're not thriving. And we wanna cross that other chasm. So you know, for a very, very long time, I think we've been asking everybody the wrong question, right? Because look at these statistics. 80% of adults are not thriving mentally. 95% of adults aren't engaged in the top three to five health behaviors. By the way, this is, these are worldwide statistics. Um, I can provide all the links to these studies um, uh, after the, the presentation today, if, you, if you'd like to dive in. Um, and 65% are overweight or obese. 70% aren't engaged in work. I mean, stuff's not meaningful. This is, this is more than an epidemic. So the search really for happiness is universal. And positive psychology is all about cultivating the power of happiness, mindfulness, and your unique strengths, which are really associated with your values. And I'm going to talk about um, the founder of positive psychology, his name is Martin Seligman in just a bit, but it, since World War II, uh, general psychology became a science, uh, science largely about healing, right? It concentrates on repairing damage within a disease model of human functioning, so, right? Post-World War, there was a huge need, especially in the United States, uh, to help people that were suffering from trauma, from post-traumatic stress disorder, from so much mental health and, and, and suffering that the government and, and funding and uh, healthcare had to shift in order to treat that. But at, at the same time, we kind of forgot to focus on the other side of psychology, which is, well, what about the people who already do well? And what is it that they do that makes them do well, right? That's, that's what we want to look at. There's got to be a reason and a correlation. So um, there's been a focus on, on weaknesses, what's wrong with people, right? Which factors impair human functioning? And I mean, if you look in the literature, look this, all the psychological abstracts, if, if you take it from 1967 to 2000, and you compare on the left, those are all negative emotions. General psychology is, is, is primarily studied that anger, anxiety, depression, and compare it to positive emotions, joy, happiness, and life satisfaction. There is a 
21 to one ratio of scientific literature that is cited in the negative versus the positive. So there's, there's been this focus on weakness. And if we look at this picture, we'll say negative five represents suffering from problems. We'll say zero represents not suffering from these problems anymore. And plus five represents a flourishing and fulfilled life. So the disease model is focused on the negative five to zero section. And interventions that are grounded in this model have a goal of helping people move from negative five to zero. In a clinical context, this could mean that a therapist aims to reduce symptoms and prevent relapse. The end goal is zero point. It's achieved when the client is no longer experiencing diagnosable symptoms of psychopathology uh, as described um, in their Bible, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM. So this, this, is, this has been a problem. And some of the misconceptions, right? It's like, well, we think we need to focus on weaknesses, right? Focus on your weaknesses to be more well-rounded. Well, fixing what's wrong automatically leads to well-being. Not necessarily. There's a positive and an effect and a negative effect. They're not on the same continuum. Getting rid of anger, fear, and depression will not automatically cause peace, love, and joy. And so the absence of mental illness doesn't necessarily imply the presence of mental health and vice versa. All right. So again, that this neutral point doesn't equal flourishing. So to, to, to put another point in here, as I, I bring it together, it's, uh, I, I want to take you guys through a little bit of an exercise, a little challenge, if I may. Um, I'm going to give you guys 25 seconds. And when I say go, the next slide, you need to try to remember as many images as you can that have red in it. Okay. And if you, if you can't write it down, like in what the picture is, you're going to have 25 seconds in just a moment. On the next slide, you need to identify and try to remember as many pictures as you can that have the color red in it. Okay. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. You have 25 seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. All right. So I'm curious how many of those red images can you actually recall and remember? And if you could remember four, at least four. Put your name in the chat or say that you did that. How many of you guys were able to remember at least four images and that, recall what they were? I'm um, looking at the chat. A lot of people remember six. Some people remember 10, up to oh. 14 even. Um, yeah, wide range. Excellent. 14, that's very impressive. <sighs> so, uh, well, I didn't mention the next part of this challenge. Um, so uh, I apologize, but uh, we got one more part. What I didn't ask you was this. How many green images can you remember from that picture? And be honest. Go ahead and put it in the chat again. That's How many two. green images One. can you remember? One. Four. Five. Zero. Four. Seven. Mm. Six, nice. eight, nine, yep. So a little bit less, right? It's kind of a trick. And it, it, the truth is there's actually 16 red images and there's 16 green images. And it's not, you didn't fail the exercise, right? There's nothing wrong with you, but your focus was only on one thing. And our brains, 
tend to, uh, our energy flows where our attention goes, right? So when you're thinking about one thing, the brain's, it, it's, has a very difficult time multitasking, especially if it doesn't know the bigger picture. So we've focused on people's weaknesses and their illnesses and everything for so long because it was such a problem that it's not, you know, that psychologists and our, our, our sick care system is bad and they're not bad people. We're not saying that, but what we're saying is where's, where's the focus, right? Our focus has been on people's weaknesses and what's wrong. And so I want to throw this to you guys as you think about yourself and the greater context of health and well-being and sustainability. Reflect on where, where is your focus on your own health, on others, on society? Is it looking at the weaknesses? Is it looking at what's wrong? Are you hard on yourself? Think about that. So again, uh, to summarize this, uh, and to give a definition of positive psychology, it's, this is Dr. Martin Seligman, who was a clinical psychologist in, the, in that field uh, for quite uh, some time, almost uh, 30 years. And he, so he knows that field very well. And so when um, Martin Seligman became the president of the American Psychological Association in 1998, he had a vision of a new domain of psychology. So rather than mainly focusing on what ails the human mind, which is, you know, uh, neurosis, anxiety, depression, uh, Seligman proposed that psychology turn more of its attention to the conditions that enable people to flourish, to what makes people feel engaged, fulfilled, and authentically and meaningfully happy. This movement became known as positive psychology, and it's delivered important applications for coaches um, as an evidence-based body of knowledge to support the process of behavior change and foster levels, higher levels of well-being. So this movement led by Seligman and his colleague, uh, Christopher Peterson, they also uh, completed a deep and thorough exploration of the character strengths and virtues, um, which is understanding what is right with humans and not mostly what is wrong. He has developed a new model for human thriving and flourishing. And this is the, to summarize uh, what uh, his model is, um, this is his new theory of well-being, which it spells out the word PERMA. It's well-being is a construct um, and uh, it's not happiness, right? The, the topic of, of positive psychology um, is, is putting that together. And well-being has five measurable elements, P-E-R-M-A, positive emotion, of which happiness and life satisfaction, uh, all aspects of that, engagement, which you can think of things like uh, getting into flow state, right? Uh, my uh, uh, time and space disappear because you're so engaged, right? Or being engaged at work because it's meaningful. Relationships, positive relationships with others, creating meaning and purpose in your own life and accomplishment or achievements. So there's not one element that necessarily defines well-being, but each contributes to the bigger picture and some aspects of the five are measured sub subjectively uh, by self-report others can be measured objectively so um we'll, we'll dive into a little bit of this now and and overall this we've shifted the focus right positive psychology is the scientific study i want to i want to emphasize it. it's a scientific study of optimal human functioning that aims to discover and promote the factors that allow individuals and our communities to thrive. So we shift to a focus on strengths. What's right about people? What factors promote human flourishing? And how do we go from neutral to plus five? How do we move the needle out of the disease sick state into a whole new way of living. And this is a video that summarizes basically everything I just said about positive psychology. Um, it's, it'll be put in the chat if you guys want to watch. Um, we won't watch it today. So um, there is, 
no, we won't play this. I'll, I'll send this video out as well, um, which talks all about the how to, to discover your own unique strengths and uh, the, the science of character and how uh, with one simple self free self assessment, you can figure out what you're naturally good at. And they're directly correlated with what you inherently value most in life. And when you align your strengths with your values and you apply that to things that you do, it is a way to promote and increase happiness um, more than anything and engagement and, and create more experiences of flow and meaning in your life. And it's broken down into these, these uh, virtues where all of these 24 character strengths um, follow. And everyone, it's unique for everybody. So everything follows in, into these categories of virtues. I won't go into that just right now. I'll let you guys go explore and get curious to figure out what your own unique strengths are. Um, but, but happiness, right? What, what is it? Uh, it's our basic temperament is, is, is inherently, uh, it's inherited. But despite this, we do have considerable control over how happy we feel. And positive psychologists, um, uh, Sonia Lombarski and her colleagues estimate that on average, happiness is 50% inherited. Another 40% 40, 40 is under your own control and the final 10% depends on circumstances. If you compare that to, you know, things like height, right, or uh, um, other components of genetic uh, genetics, which are, you know, height and, and weight, that's 90% heritable. But happiness is 50%. So there's a lot of room to work with. These are some fantastic studies um, that prove the correlation of happiness and improved health, um, even preventing and reversing some disease and uh, longer lifespan. Um, Nunn's study is a very, very famous thing um, that looked at the correlation of positive emotions and how, uh, how long these nuns lived um, over the course of uh, 75 to 95 years. Um, again, I'll put those links to those studies um, in the notes after if you guys want to dive in. So if I want to wrap all this together in, in, in how do we create this, right? Because it all can sound like a bunch of woo-woo and uh, almost uh, uh, too good to be true, right? It sounds fantastic on paper, um, but how do we cultivate this? And how do we create happiness for ourselves? So and. A related area of newer research suggests that people are happiest when they when they when they're focusing their minds on the present rather than thinking about other topics, places, or times. And a Harvard psychologist, uh, you may have heard of him, Daniel Gilbert, and there's also Matthew Killingsworth. Daniel Gilbert's responsible for creating emotional intelligence, um, big name. But anyways, he set up an experiment designed to record how frequently people's minds wander and what they wander to and how it affects their moods. And they designed a smartphone application that contacted 2,250 adult volunteers at random intervals. And they asked them how they were feeling, what they were doing, and whether they were thinking, were thinking about what they were doing or thinking about something else in the moment. And the researchers found that people spend about half of their time thinking about things other than what's going on around them. This is called mind wandering. And it takes the form of thinking about events that happened either in the past, maybe in the future, or will never happen at all. And it doesn't make us happy. Rather, people in the study were happiest when their minds were focused on the activity in the moment. And so the research published in, in the, uh, the academic um, uh, literature reinforces the, the advice of various even religions, philosophies, therapies that have suggested since ancient times that happiness and fulfillment may be found more easily by living in the moment, being in the here and now, and experiencing the present to its fullest, rather than thinking constantly about other things. So, and you can actually go to it's like www.trackyourhappiness.org um, and uh, download the app and figure out what specific factors make you happy. Um, but overall, 46.9% of your waking hours, people are, are, their minds are wandering. And 30% of the time, it's, it's almost all activities except for sex. That is the one activity that people are extremely and fully present in. 
and then uh, the, the, there is negative impacts on overall happiness. So I say this because all this ties into why we need to focus on mindfulness first, which is really, it's more about self-awareness. And these pathways to create this all start with the self. I'm going to skim through a lot of this stuff. You guys will have a chance to, to go through the content later and dive in. Um, but ultimately, mindfulness is not about relaxing. It's not a religion. It's not a way to change thoughts. It's not difficult. It's also not easy. And it's a way to not be concerned. Uh, it's not a way to not be concerned with the future anymore. Um, and it's impossible to investigate. It's not impossible to investigate scientifically. There is tons and tons of literature on this. So defined, mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And that is from uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's, who's considered one of the, the fathers of bringing mindfulness to the United States and uh, kind of taking it out of some of the religious concepts and bringing it to uh, stress reduction and applying it to the rest of life. And ultimately, living in the present sounds like it should be easy enough. <laughs> the present, after all, is it's where our bodies are. But the problem, says uh, Dr. Kabat-Zinn, is that our minds are often somewhere else. All right, They wander, they worry, they regret and anticipate and have expectations. And in the process of all that thinking, we get stressed out. So the key to being calm and clear, to healing both your body and your mind, is learning how to become a human being again, rather than a human doing. Uh, you Singaporeans, I've noticed you love to do, do. You guys, you guys are fantastic multitaskers. Um, but it uh, it's takes so much away from the human experience and presence is a way of being in the world, right? That it creates growth and it creates connection and it does require skills because it sounds like a bunch of woo woo at first. Um, and when you choose to do it and you do it with things that you value, um, it strengthens everything um, that, and creates the environment for you to flourish and get what you really want. So, the five core components of mindfulness are attention, open awareness, acceptance, no identification, and choice, essentially being non judgmental. Um, we talked about this, right? Being in the past, right? We're in the future. And what sort of things can we do to get into the here and now? So I'm going to play a video for you that's only 15 seconds long. And uh, this, for some of you, may have been uh, an experience of what, what it was like to try mindfulness or meditation for your first time. Or if you're like me, um, where you have this monkey mind that goes insane and it's, I can't silence things. And I'm thinking about all these different ideas and innovations and uh it's so hard to think, how can I just be, right? And not think about thinking. It, there's all these misconceptions about mindfulness. Yet it's extremely popular and it's very, um, it's very misunderstood. So um, this is a video of the Grinch uh, trying to meditate for the first time. And like I said, I think it describes how a lot of us um, have felt when we try to silence our minds. And release all of those sounds that are trapped in your mind. Sir, are you okay? I'm a little messed up. <laughs> oh man, it, it kills me every and time. Um, he said, I'm sorry, I'm a little messed up. Right? And it's is this idea that, that mindfulness somehow takes all those thoughts away and uh, you're just going to go to this, transcend to this higher place of being and never think about thoughts. And I mean, um, 
there's a lot of misconceptions, um, but there is so much science behind it. And if you learn to do it right, you can apply it to every part of your life. And, you know, being able to, to recognize your own thoughts is a very powerful tool. Um, it, you can't really turn it off. It's always going to go. It never goes away. Um, and that disconnects us from the present moment. So there's something called the mindfulness muscle, right? When you realize that thoughts aren't facts, right? They're thoughts. And when you're non-judgmental, you can just observe those thoughts being caught and then simply bring your attention back to the present moment. And the, one of the easiest ways to do that is focus on your breath. So you're focusing on your breath and then you notice, oh, I'm, that was a thought about uh, the presentation I got to give later. Or, oh, I, I forgot to uh, pack my lunch. You just, you don't judge yourself for it. You just say, oh, there's, an, there's a thought. And then the act of bringing that attention back to your breath actually strengthens what we call this mindfulness muscle. And this is linked to, to increasing gray matter, um, all sorts of, of positive emotions, um, people being able to uh, cope with, with really difficult situations and create resilience, right? Because they're able to recognize things and bring themselves back to the present moment without letting it derail them. So the more you do this, the more you practice mindfulness, and you just come back to the present moment, the more um, this mindfulness muscle gets strengthened. And so to end this session, I want to take you guys through um, a one-minute guided mindful uh, breathing technique that you guys can use at any time. Um, and so, you know, I, and I invite you guys to first just turn your attention inward and think about where your mind is right now. Is it is your mind full, right? Is it distracted? Is it got all these things in there that you got to do in the past, present? Or are you really being mindful right now? Just take note of that and don't judge yourself. Your mind is, it's, it's like an internet connection. It, it's got limited bandwidth. So the more it tries to process at any one time, the worse it works. That's why this idea of multitasking is not so good. And the people around you can tell when your head isn't there. It's really therefore crucial to be mindful and fully present rather than having a mind full of distractions. Beyond yourself, life ultimately, I believe, is about relationships and human connections. But it's also whatever's meaningful to you. So how do we get there? And I wanna take you guys through this technique right now. So first, um, feel free to close your eyes or just bring your attention to this calmful scene and bring some of that noise down and calm your mind, start to slow down your breath. And imagine that your mind, your mind as an orchestra, all of your concerns, your thoughts and your worries, these are the strings, the woodwinds, the percussion, now imagine that the inner conductor, right, your mind's eye, uses the baton to bring that whole orchestra down to silence. So quiet, you can hear a pin drop. And if you haven't done so already, feel free to close your eyes. And I want you to take three long, deep breaths. Bring the air in through your nose and let it out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. And one more time. And this will calm your parasympathetic nervous system and soothe your mind. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, bring your attention back to the room, and take note of how you feel. 
Does your body feel different? That space behind your eyes, what you're thinking about. No judgments. So putting this into practice again is a, it's a bit of a call to action to, to a lot of you. So I, I, I believe some of you guys are the leaders in the industry and the world um, that are looking at sustainability and well-being as a way to, to cultivate this. And so putting all this stuff into practice, right? It sounds great, um, but how do we get it? It's not always the easiest thing to do by yourself. Sometimes it takes people to look at you differently and ask different questions. And I share this story to close this presentation and then I'll hand it over to B. Early in the 16th century, some of you guys may have recognized this. This is Michelangelo. He was commissioned to sculpt the David. And when choosing the marble to use, Michelangelo chose a piece that was disregarded by other sculptors and it was de deemed unworkable due to the grain of the marble. Uh, just as, you know, a new, uh, a new health coach, a new personal trainer, a doctor, a, a leader, uh, a coworker, you know, might determine a client or a patient, coworker, employee, unworkable. Whatever your role, right? Any type of leadership or, or uh, healthcare role, you, you've had those people, you know, it's not workable. And so when Michelangelo saw the marble, he envisioned the David trapped inside. And for many years, he worked relentlessly on chiseling away at the marble and, and many more he worked on refining the sculpture. And when the piece was finally complete, people were astonished and asked how we could create such a masterpiece with the same marble other sculptors had deemed unworkable. Michelangelo explained that once he had that vision of the David inside the marble, he simply removed everything that was not the David. Michelangelo knew his purpose and that was to finish the sculpture and was willing to work continuously to bring that vision from his mind to reality. So if you're committed to helping yourself, uh, the people that you work with and that you serve, your clients, your patients, your coworkers, um, your employees, you know, if you're committed to help them define their purpose, help them get clear on what they wish to become, not what you want for them, right? But your effort and your coaching your space that you hold are necessary to bring their vision to life. And using the tools of, of coaching, positive psychology, instructing, teaching, and unconditional positive regard, you can sculpt your, your career and meaning in your life to the masterpiece it was predestined to become by ultimately helping others become the masterpiece they are meant to be. And so with that, um, I, I, uh, you know, invite you all to, to dive deeper and um, take, take another look at how you can bring this into your life and, and ultimately transcend it to um, those all around you. Bring awareness to the things that you love, the things that you don't. Do more of the things you love and less of the things that you don't love and align your behaviors in your life with what it is you most authentically enjoy that gives you the most sense of meaning and puts you in that place of engagement and allows you to create those meaningful relationships. So is this new model for human thriving, it's don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And with that, I will turn it over to B who's going to shift into the body and take you guys through some more movements and uh, stay curious and thank you guys. Hi everybody and thanks so much to Mark for bringing us to you know, this concept about positive psychology and having the, the mindfulness in us, the awareness in us, and how many of us here wants to be like Michelangelo? For one, I would like to be like him. I have a vision in mind. And how can I chisel a David which I envision? So, so I would like to encourage every one of you to probably be on this Michelangelo journey together with us. So for this Session. As you see, I'm in my so-called um, workout attire. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite everybody. Sorry, Bikun. Sorry for interrupting. There's a bit of background noise. Is it possible for you to speak up a little bit? It's quite soft. Right. Can you hear me clear? It's better now. Yeah, it's clear now. Okay. All right. Um, so for today's um, session, as we know that our number one public health enemy is actually sitting other than COVID-19, which we are going to conquer in no time. All right, so, so uh, today's session, I'm going to bring you through, I think 13 exercises. But with these exercises, what I would like to invite everybody to do is to get up from your seat if possible, you know, and follow me in the movements. And what, what is special about these movements is, I would like you to concentrate on your breathing and to feel and be aware of your bodily sensation. So with this, I would, like, I would love to call this movement meditation or mindful movement. So today there are four parts to these exercises. The first part is a kind of like a warm-up exercise. I'll just do some um, two quick warm-up exercises to just get our body activated. After which, we will do three sections of mobility exercises. So I will focus on the ankle and the foot, our hips and our thoracic spine. Why is that so? Because these three major joints are meant to be mobile. Meaning to say, it is supposed to be able to bend forward and backwards. It's supposed to bend sideways and it's supposed to be even able to rotate slightly. So some of our joints, which are mobile as well, but not as mobile as our ankle, our hip and our thoracic spine will be, for example, our shoulders, our lumbar spine, which is our lower back, and even our knees. So before I move into the exercise itself, just give an illustration that, for example, if our hips are immobile because we are a sitting nation, guess what? Which are the joints that will be compromised? Perhaps our lumbar spine, whereby some of us experience lower back pain, or our knees, you know, whereby when we jog, we realize that, ouch, our knees hurt. So without further ado, um, my first set of exercises, we will do four reps each and then um, just follow me, all right? Um, the first exercise, the first exercise, uh, first two exercises are called warding. It helps um, us to warm up our body. Okay, first step, split stance in a very comfortable position. I'm not sure whether you're ready. If you're seated, you can follow me in this exercise. In a praying position, and you push your hands against each other, you feel the tension and you release. So how do we breathe here? We breathe in as we get into the position. We breathe out as we get out of the position. Two more reps. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. So for the next exercise and the subsequent exercise, other than the breathing, I'd like you to notice your bodily sensations. All right? So again, split stance position. Opposite hand and opposite knee. I'm going to push against, use my hand to push against my knee, giving it a little bit of tension and we relax. All right, we'll do four reps. Breathe in, tension, breathe out. Breathe in, as you put in the little pressure, feel your abs. You know, I love body exercises. Because these warding exercises allow me to train my core without needing to do a two-minute plank on the floor. Okay, let's change side. All 
right comfortable position. Turn the split stance. Breathe in. Breathe out. Concentrate on your bodily sensation. How do you feel in some of your body parts, especially your core? Right, with these two exercises, we should be a little bit warm up. Next, we go into our foot and ankle mobility drills. The first one, just lean against a wall. For me, I'm going towards my cabinet. You can use a chair to support yourself. Alright, I'm going to do a toe and heel lifts. Okay, so for those of you who, who understand like the, the the fitness terms, it is to help us do, uh, uh, to do flexion, to, to dorsiflex and plantar flex. Okay, so you look at my feet, alright? So first, I do a heel lift. Slowly down. Toe lifts. The second anchor exercise is pretty simple. You can hang on to a support, a chair or something, or you can just put your hand on your waist. And I'm going to do ankle circles. I'll do clockwise, anti-clockwise, and come back to 12 o'clock. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Change leg, okay. breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Breathe out. One last breath. Did you feel your ankle? Breathe out. Alright. So these are the two very, very simple exercises for our ankle and foot. Right? So the next part of it is of course our hips. Like I say, our hips are supposed to be able to move forward, backwards, sideways, and even rotate. So hip mobility for me, personally, I feel that it is extremely important for a sitting nation like us. Like I say, our number one public health enemy is actually sitting, other than COVID-19, right? So the first exercise, wide split stance again. And what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to hinge down, so I breathe in, and I'm going to shift my hips forward and my hands Overhead. Okay, shall we try a few more times? Breathe in. Breathe out. Concentrate on the pelvis going out and this, the hip pinching down. Not the lumbar spine, uh, you shouldn't be feeling in your lumbar spine, but you should be feeling your hips pushing out. Okay, push the hips out. Last breath. Right. Oh yeah, you can change side. Sorry, there's a aeroplane flying across the house. So he pinch. You see my tabletop, my back? Push out the hips.
Again, any of these drills can be deployed, can be used any time of the day to break the inactivity during the day. All right. So for the first T-spine activity, feet shoulder width apart. Maybe I should turn this side. I just shoulder width apart. All right. And then I'll reach out and see. There's a stationary chair behind me. So the focus is to bring awareness to your spine and lengthen that spine. Right? Okay. 
thing. So as you get into the position you breathe in, as you get out of the position you breathe out. So let's breathe in, breathe out. You breathe in, you breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. One more time. Breathe in, lengthen that spine. And breathe out. So the, the third um, T spine mobility exercises, feet wide apart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on one side, but my opposite hands, my body as my torso kind of like rotate, I stretch out my hands from the other side. Okay, that's one breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. You should be able to feel your T-spine becoming more comfortable. Breathe in. Breathe out. One last breath on this side and then we change time. Breathe in. Now we change side. I'm going to sit over this side now. Breathe in. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out and one last thread. In. Breathe out. One last um, T-spine exercise. Narrow, narrow stance. And then we just take one step forward. Okay, and we are going to do some bending. So uh, my arms, opposite arm, I go to that side. And the other hand will pull the other way. So I'm side bending. As you get into the position, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Let's change side, our last four reps before we end. as a warm-up and then just now we did our ankle and the foot and then we did the hips and the t-spine so like I mentioned before you just need to remember two to three of these exercises and as you want to break up in activity during the day just do a few reps and if you want to make it a workout you can also do that you know have it at a faster tempo and then maybe perhaps more repetitions. So with that, I thank you for your time. And on behalf of Active SG, thank you for spending this one hour with myself and Mark. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of the workshop. Thank you again and um, stay safe, everybody.